So welcome to this video where I want to have a look at the solar system, how it formed, what we've started to realise about interstellar objects and what that might mean for future exploration of the solar system going forward. So if we first have a look at what we think happened to the solar system or how it we think it formed. So we think it formed from a gas, a disc, uh, a cloud of gas and dust that then formed a disc around the early sun and then the planets formed in the disc and then we're left behind with the planets and any other material orbiting around which is like your asteroids and the minor planets and things like that. Now in order to get the configuration that we have it's thought that the outer planets were in resonance so Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune were all in orbital resonances with each other so that means that for example, Jupiter would orbit three times for two orbits of Saturn and so on. So there was this resonance chain between all the outer planets. They migrated inwards in the gas disk and we're left with this configuration that we currently see. And it explains why ours is slightly different to what we see around um, other stars. Now, in order to do that, it actually requires a fifth ice giant. So there's a few different scenarios, but one of the more favourable ones is that there is a fifth gas giant past, well, actually, it's kind of um, amongst all the other ones, and then it is ejected during the migration process. So there's an instability that occurs, and then it kind of gets thrown out. So it's ejected from the system. It's no longer part of the solar system. Now, interestingly, that's thought to be not uncommon in other planetary systems so ejecting planets from a planetary system during the early part where it's a little bit unstable is fairly common so in, at least in simulations and th theoretical work you can replicate these planets being ejected now an ejected planet then becomes a free-floating rogue planet so it no longer orbits a star it's free-floating around on its own it's a sad planet just orbiting around. Well, it's not orbiting anything, actually. It's just free floating in space. No star. And we have actually found quite a lot of these planets. So if we look at a star, so let's assume we have a background star. If a planet passes in front of the star, as viewed from Earth, it can act as a lens. So it acts as a gravitational lens and it can slightly magnify the background star. So if we just watch a star we like watch lots of stars and then if it's ever so slightly magnified as a planet passes in front we can detect these rogue planets it's called micro lensing and it only magnifies the star by a very small amount but it's the main technique that we would use for detecting the rogue planets and then you've got two examples there of rogue planets that have been captured from micro lensing now on the y-axis you've got the magnitude of the star, so that's how bright the star is, and because it's backwards, a lower magnitude basically means that it's brighter. So as the planet passes in front, it very slightly increases its brightness of that background star, and we can detect how massive that planet is, the size of the planet from that, just by looking at this background star. So that's two examples of this micro-lensing technique that's used to detect these these rogue planets basically so we know that there's quite a few of them around and this is how they've been detected now if we then zoom out to the milky way to the galaxy any galaxy or spiral galaxy for that matter the stars are orbiting in a relatively common direction so it's like a disc where the spiral arms are they are orbiting in the common direction these stars you can assume that those stars have got planets at least some of them are going to have planets that are orbiting around them, like the solar system. Now, they have a common direction that they're all orbiting, but the flow of the stars and the planetary systems is slightly different. So there's some random motion there, or relative motion from one another. So they can get close to each other, they can move further apart. And actually, if they do get too close, they can gravitationally perturb each other. So they can actually cause ejections of planets just from encountering each other. So we would call that a stellar flyby when they, these two stars fly past each other fairly close. The gravitational forces from one another can then alter the orbits of the planets and in extreme cases they can then eject some planets. So you end up with even more rogue planets from that process as well. 
Now, if we then assume that along with these stars, with their own planets, there's then these rogue planets moving around with them. And again, if any of those rogue planets comes within a set distance at a relatively low velocity, they can get gravitationally captured by that star. So one star throws it out and then it gets close enough to another star that it gets captured into that system. So you end up with a planetary system with a planet that didn't form with that star, which is starting to get quite interesting. So I've noted here the Hill Sphere. So we've got a star in the centre and the Hill Sphere is like the gravitational sphere of influence. So within that area, if it's closer than the Hill Sphere, then it can be gravitationally bound to the star, the larger object. Now, an object moving within that, if it's moving slow enough and <clears throat> it gets close enough to the star, then it can get gravitationally captured. Now, it has to be a fairly low velocity. If it's a higher velocity, the rogue planet will basically go straight through that, that hill sphere and straight out the other side. But if it encounters at a low enough velocity, so let's assume that they're travelling in the same direction. They're just ever so slightly, so maybe the, the star catches up with the planet and it passes into this hill sphere, then it could end up on a new orbit around that star. So these rogue planets would then come a captured planet. It's no longer free-floating. The same is actually true for moons. So in our solar system, there's actually a lot of captured moons around the outer planets. So again, if a minor planet or an asteroid or small object comes close enough to another planet and it's moving slow enough that it can get captured so it doesn't go flying through, it can come out the other side, then it can be captured onto a new orbit as well. Now, this isn't just theoretical anymore. We have actually found lots of these captured objects in the solar system. So Jupiter, for example, it has the Galilean moons and it has this prograde group of moons orbiting it. Now, the prograde and the Galilean moons are orbiting in the same direction plane as the rotation of Jupiter and also the general orbital direction of Jupiter around the Sun, which suggests that they typically formed with the planet. But then there's this retrograde group orbiting around the outside and they're orbiting in the opposite direction. So it's called the retrograde group because they are in a retrograde motion. They're orbiting in the opposite direction. They will typically have higher inclinations. So they will be more inclined compared to the prograde group. They might have higher eccentricities and they can be located further out. And the only way you can really get those sorts of orbits is if they're captured. They can't really form in situ in that kind of configuration. So we know that many of these objects have already captured when they've got too close to Jupiter. The same is true for Neptune, Saturn and Uranus. Now a notable one is Triton. So Triton is Neptune's largest moon. It's actually the largest captured object in the solar system and it's bigger than Pluto and it also has an atmosphere. Now that is orbit, so it's spinning the opposite way. It's rotate. it's actually orbiting Neptune retrograde, the same as the retrograde group around Jupiter. So this is a captured object, and in its own right, could have been a planet if it was orbiting the sun further in. So you've basically got a gas giant there, which has then captured a minor planet, which has then become a moon. And it does have an atmosphere as well, which makes it even more interesting. So all of these outer planets then have actually got captured moons and even Mars, actually. So Mars has a couple of captured moons. The Earth could capture moons if any object got too close as well. But because the outer planets are obviously further away from the actual sun, their hill spheres are larger. So they have the ability to um, capture objects easier they're also larger so we know that all of the outer planets have got captured moons in the same manner as jupiter and neptune exoplanets are thought to have been found with captured or other stars are thought to be captured exoplanets around them so here you've got a exoplanet that is on a retrograde orbit and again one of the scenarios 
to have an orbit that's retrograde compared to the prograde like they would form in is if it's captured now there is another scenario where you could actually have a scattering event so if two planets got close to one another during the formation process they can scatter each other and then you can put an orbit you can basically incline the orbit a lot you can then change it so it's not just captured objects that could account for these unusual retrograde orbits but it is one process so there's hints that exoplanets that have currently been found could already be captured rogue planets so we've got captured moons in the solar system we've got captured exoplanets as well but let's go back to the solar system and where are they being captured from how are they getting captured well a lot of them are thought to be on heliocentric orbits which means that they are orbiting the sun in the same manner that the planet is or is orbiting the sun as well so they're kind of moving in a common direction maybe the minor planet catches up with the planet it then falls into this hill sphere and can get captured that way the relative velocity there is low enough then that you can actually get captured um, so that's one scenario maybe the planet captures up with a minor planet but their tip thought you know heliocentric capture is one process a, another one is that they are captured centaurs. So these are a group of objects that orbit between the outer planets. So between Jupiter and Neptune, there's this group, and they're on un un unstable orbits. So because they're orbiting in between the gas giants, they get perturbed by them. So they can't remain there on stable orbits, so that they are unstable. But because of that, they are a candidate for capture as well. So they can be they can end up on orbits that would put them close enough to these planets that would capture them. And then the scatter disk and the Kuiper belt, which are located outside of Neptune, are also thought to be a location where they could get captured from. So around outside of Neptune, you have this large kind of disk-like structure of objects, which is kind of where Pluto is. And beyond and they can then get perturbed their orbits can be modified a little bit they can be changed which moves them inwards and then onto an orbit or trajectory where they could get captured so it's thought that the scatterdisk and carpet belt could be a reservoir for objects that could then end up being captured but it starts to get a bit more interesting in the last couple of years so we have now two confirmed objects that have come into the solar system that are interstellar in origin. So these have come from without the, outside the solar system. They've passed through the inner solar system and back out again. So you've got a comet and an asteroid. They have passed through the solar system. This is actually fairly recently, which hints that this is not particularly a rare occurrence. Now, these were traveling quite fast and they have actually been able to pass through the solar system. But if their relative velocities were lower, there's no reason why they couldn't have been captured. The only thing that's prevented them from being captured is their relatively high velocity. But the fact that we've got interstellar objects passing through the solar system, you know, currently, is actually quite exciting. Now, I'll leave you with some thoughts, really. So we know that rogue planets can be generated. We know that rogue planets can likely be captured. And we know that moons can be captured in the solar system. We know, so if we know that planets can be captured, minor planets can be captured by other stars and ejected out. One thought is actually that a lot of the, well not a lot, but some outer objects could already be captured from other stars. And how would we actually know? So some of these objects that are already in the outer part of the solar system could be captured objects. And then the thought is, if they, if we have interstellar objects hiding in our outer solar system, and we know that they, that area can act as a reservoir for captured moons, they then get kind of scattered inwards or moved inwards. Could some of the captured moons then be interstellar in origin? You know, for example, Phoebe is a captured moon around Saturn. We don't really know where it came from. What if it was an object that came from kind of like the scatter disk, but then much earlier on had an interstellar origin.
we don't really know any of this information at the moment but if it was possible then some of these moons could be interstellar in origin and we can get to them fairly easily so we can get to the outer planets we've sent spacecraft there already and if there's interstellar objects orbiting them already it's very straightforward to get to them instead of going to another star so it opens up some interesting questions really and then finally really there's the, the planet nine which is thought to be lurking in the outer part of the solar system now it could be that planet nine was that fifth planet required in the solar system the, the fifth gas giant that was ejected out but actually wasn't it fully ejected and it was just scattered outwards or could it potentially be a captured exoplanet, a rogue planet that got too close and was captured? Or it might not exist at all because we haven't found it. There's only some potential hints that there's an object located further out due to the movement of some of the outer objects. But there's a few scenarios, really. And looking at other systems and what's happening, you know, could it be interstellar in origin? So I will leave you with that thought really to think about and thank you for watching and if you enjoy the video then you can check out some of the other ones